Welcome to the Archive Room Podcast. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Fast am I, I'm Judith Lay, and I'm very pleased to find you waiting for me at the door to the Archive Room, the place where we keep stories of island life in years gone by, told by the people who were there. So, come on in, sit down and make yourself comfortable, and let's listen to this week's selection. Our stories this week are all rooted in Balaf. Laura Briggs has a memorable wartime connection to the village and husband and wife, Kenny and Connie Brew, have a lifetime link there. But before we head north, let's listen to a tribute to someone whose voice we will never hear, but whose life and work inspire our island's nurses to this very day. She is Nellie Brennan, and here's Bob Carswell with her story in an episode of The History Makers. The misery of poverty and sickness in the old Douglas of the early 19th century was something Nellie Brennan sought to alleviate. As Thomas Howard, the curate and later the vicar of St George's Church, tells us, it was not uncommon for Nellie to go to the rich to ask aid for the poor. This woman, so full of goodness herself, had a wonderful faculty for drawing out the moral qualities of others, and they deemed it a privilege to be permitted to assist her in works of charity. Yet she always considered herself the obliged party. In 1832, Douglas was afflicted with the dreaded disease cholera. The roads out of the town were filled with refugees seeking safety outside the centre of population. But Nellie Brennan continued to visit the sick and dying as she always used to do, and she did whatever she could for them. In fact, to such, said Balan Stoll, Nellie flew with willing feet, proving an invaluable aid to the medical men with her quiet energy, intelligently carrying out all their directions. Thomas Howard often saw Nellie carrying out her errands of mercy in the town as he went round comforting his parishioners. He said of her, Although Nellie's health was by no means good, nothing revolted her, however disgusting. Nothing daunted her, however difficult. The cases in which she braved infection and bad air and all the loathsomeness of squalid poverty are numerous. This was a time when lanterns were hung from the trees in St George's churchyard so that bodies could be carried there at all hours and tipped into a large grave marked by nothing more than a small cross bearing the one word, cholera. The same sad sight can be seen in old Kirk Braddon. There was a certain amount of rejoicing as the cholera epidemic appeared to subside, but... It was premature, and the cholera epidemic returned as strongly as ever. Throughout, Nellie Brennan carried on her good work, visiting the poor, the sick and the dying. Since few would risk contact with the disease, Nellie Brennan was to be found laying out victims, placing them in parish coffins, and on one occasion she had to borrow a coal cart to take them for burial. Nobody else would do the duty. Bellan Stoll tells us that She was of a very delicate organisation and frequently suffered from nausea while attending the sick. But attend them she did, in their homes in Douglas and in the cholera hospital. I'm not without natural fear, she said once, but I use the means for preserving health and pray to the Lord to keep me in safety. And blessed be his holy name, he has enabled me to go in and out among them, poor things, thirty-nine years in safety. But her practical Christian charity caused many people to stop sending their clothes to be pressed and folded by her for fear of the cholera. She sought employment elsewhere and got a job as laundress at the Castle Mona, living in a lodge in the grounds. But she soon gave this up because she found it too far from Douglas Town to visit the sick and the poor. How she managed to support herself is something of a mystery, but on one occasion she was quite out of funds, and she says she lay on her bed reciting, The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want... A short time later, a knock came at the door, and Mrs. Wetherall, one of the charitable ladies of the town, came in to insist she accepted twelve guineas for her invaluable services. Most of this went on charity to others. Nellie herself was a diligent collector for charity, and it was said of her, her kindness to the poor was indeed extraordinary. Her own means were but small, but she was willing to impart of her little to help those who were quite destitute. In the mid-nineteenth century, some benevolent ladies of the town held a massive sale of work, raising about £300, which was to endow a medical dispensary and sick hospital in Fort Street in Douglas. And the perfect choice as matron of the hospital was Nellie Brennan. 
she was absolutely delighted. This was another occasion on which she'd reached the end of her funds, and she felt her prayers had been answered. The stipend was only ten pounds a year, but Nelly was able to save enough money to buy a plot of land and build a house on what was later to become Wesley Terrace. This house she left first to a young woman she had taken in as an orphan and raised as her own. When this young woman no longer required it, it was to go for the use of four single Wesleyan women. As the unmarried Nellie Brennan once said, There are plenty of houses for widows and orphans, but there is no provision for those poor lone ones. To find the exact location of Nellie Brennan's house, who better to help us than historian Peter Kelly, as Kelly's eye rests upon the very property. Well, technically, I think we're in Willow Terrace. The house was called Wesley Cottage, but I think it is actually number three, Willow Terrace. Now, where is Willow Terrace, says the rest of the Isle of Man. If you turned in at Rose Mount, or alongside Trinity Church... Then um, you've come the wrong way, because it's one way. (laughs) Well, that's true. (laughs) I was going to say, please don't. (laughs) If you walk in that way from Prospect Terrace at the traffic lights... Come in alongside the church, and the first turning on your right brings you up Willow Terrace, and leading off is uh, Wesley Terrace, Wesley Terrace and then Hatfield the next Grove. One, Hatfield Grove. Thank you, David. And then, of course, you get the hole in the wall behind, which takes you through and uh, into a Warden Avenue, mm. or however one pronounces it these days. Right. Nellie actually had this cottage, which in reality is a house, built. It was on the outskirts of Douglas, of course, when it was built. Uh, I rather think, David, and uh, you may have a better memory of me sort of having lived in Douglas, that it used to have a little wooden porch to it, a tre- I, I, trellis work. I think work. you're right. I think you're right. It's gone, but there's certainly a shape projection which would perhaps give a hint of, of what it was like. So it would have been one of the earliest houses in this area, would it? Probably Stephen House in the wall behind us was here beforehand and Stephen Cottage and some of the buildings in Stephen Terrace, but it was fairly early on and certainly Wesley Terrace has been added on to it, you can tell by looking at the side. This, this of course, is sort of forms a gable to Wesley Terrace and faces the sun, whereas Wesley Terrace itself, uh, the front rooms uh, really are sort of facing a northerly type of direction. Mm. Now, but there's a lot of windows in this gable end, really. I mean, it's almost a two-house size for that time, isn't it? Well, it's it's a room either side of the staircase. It's it's basically its layout, and instead of being one room behind the other, typical parlour and and kitchen and back kitchen uh, arrangement, that things go sideways across. But I suppose we should say something very quickly about Nellie Brennan. Her father died, I think, two months before she was born. He was a sailor. He was Irish. I think her mother was Manx. So therefore she was brought up with a widowed mother who bought herself a large mangle and got into production uh, doing washing. Nellie became orphaned at the age of 16. She then took over that business and was very well known for her washing and mangling and she used to put little pieces of wood in the clips of the ladies' dresses to make sure they didn't get crushed when they went through the mangle. All sorts of things that was down to perfection. But looking at it, apart from the top floor where it's had sort of 1960s windows put in, all the others are original on this front and and they're that true Georgian window, although it was probably into Victoria's reign when it was built in so much there's no horns on the side and they're actually four panes wide uh, as opposed to three which you often get Mm. and two up and two down front door's been replaced but otherwise it's fairly well intact and I'm pleased to see the plaque and I'm quite sure that uh, Dr Guy Panton has had something to do with this, he certainly was involved in having the Nellie Brennan story reprinted which is sold uh, in aid of hospice She died in 1859 and is buried with her mother in St George's Churchyard and that's where the nurses of Nobles Hospital honour her every year by laying a wreath to celebrate her charitable works and her nursing. She's been described as a Manx Florence Nightingale but perhaps a more appropriate modern equivalent might be Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Her Christian faith, in her case Wesleyan, was the mainstay of her life. Her charity to the poor, her concern for the sick and her position as the first matron of a Manx hospital gave a position at the forefront of Manx social history to Nellie Brennan. Laura Briggs will be remembered by many as the wife of one of the island's most popular and knowledgeable farmers and former captain of the parish of Onken, Harvey Briggs. But although Laura's conversation with David Collister was recorded at Balakilmartin in Onken, it really has nothing to do with her life there with Harvey. 
It's all about the four years that Laura spent during the Second World War as a member of the Manx Women's Land Army, local girls doing men's work on the island farms, keeping up vital food production while the men were away in the armed forces. This conversation was recorded 24 years ago. How does it come back to you? Is it still fresh in your mind, those days that you spent in the Land Army? Oh, they're more vivid than what I did yesterday. (laughs) Are they? They really are. I was quite young when I joined the Land Army. I was at school at 16 and met Mr Howie, whom I knew quite well, and he asked me to see what I was doing. I told him I'd been applying for a job. He said, well, there's no need for you to apply for a job. Come and join my Women's Land Army, and that's how it happened. Well, well, George Howey was in charge of Knock Alo, in fact, wasn't he? He was the agricultural organiser. From what you've written about it, it seemed to me that he had a devil's own job getting enough people to join the Land Army. Oh, it was very difficult. I think I was the fifth. They had started in May of 1941 to try and recruit girls, and I was the fifth, and I started at Knock Alo on the 3rd of September of that year. He let me have my school holidays yeah. before sending word that I was to arrive at Nokelo at 7 o'clock on the 3rd of September. Who would have been at Nokelo at that time? Then? Oh, well, there were the regular men that were kept there. There was the poultry unit run by Miss Annie Neen. Mm-hmm. Like every other farm, there were the horsemen, the cowmen. They didn't actually have a dairy herd as such, but they bred the cows. Yeah. So you'd never seen a cow before this happened? Oh, no, I could milk. Yeah. I spent all my holidays down at the Barony Farm, and that's where I got to know Mr Howie because he was friendly with the manager down there, Mr Roberts, and my uncle was the stockman down there. I used to love going down there. I've spent every holiday down there. Well, one of the adverts said... Uh, applications were invited for the membership of the MWLA uh, to be the Manx Women's Land Army for work on farms within the island. Members may be placed individually on farms or may be organised as mobile squads. Now, were you ever in a mobile squad? Oh no, I spent four or five weeks at Narcalo. I started on the 3rd of September and during October I was taken down to see Mr Edinine at Balamona Bluff where I was to spend the next four years. That happened on Thursday of the week. The next day I was told I could go home and have a long weekend before right. going down to Balaf. Before I started work. Now, Balaf, to me, was the other side of the moon because yeah. we didn't travel very much in those days. I mean, the most we travelled were usually on the Sunday school picnics and that wasn't one of the routes that uh, our Sunday school picnics ever took. But the people were very friendly all around the district and if ever you were in trouble, they would help out. Right. So you'd be living in on the farm then? I lived in, yes. I was family. I lived as family. Yeah. Worked as a man, but lived as family. (laughs) (laughs) We started at quarter to six in the morning and hand milked. There was the mucking out to do first before we started to milk. And Balamona was a lovely farm. It was square. And in the middle of the square was the midden. And as the winter went on, of course, the pile got higher and higher. Yeah. And we had to go up planks with the wheelbarrows. Of course. And if it had been wet or if it had been frosty the nights before, <laughs> you often enough landed up with your face in the barrow. <laughs> well, what was in the barrow? <laughs> yes. Because your feet went from underneath you when it was getting sloping. <laughs> but, I mean, there was only one, one thing about it. It was warm. It was warm in the barrow. <laughs> <laughs> it was dark, no electricity on mm. the farms in those days. What did you have for light in the cowsheds then? Lanterns. Oh, uh-huh lanterns and we used to have to feed the mixture of oats and whatever else you were lucky enough to have crushed and when I went down there they had 16 cows he had very good cows actually beautiful short horns good milkers we milked those and then went for breakfast which was about quarter past eight down there were the three of us there was Mr Neen there was Louis Corkel who was the horseman and myself Quite shortly, Mr Neen got a milking machine, an Alpha Laval. He did the milking in the morning and Louis and myself did all the rest of the feeding because we had the beeves to feed. We had pigs and Louis, of course, would be getting his horses ready to go out onto the field. And in the afternoon, it was left to me to do the milking once we had the milk machines. But I would rather hand milk. Would you? 
Yes. Why? Always have. You get a sort of friendship with the cows. And I know there's been quite a lot on the television how music will soothe the cows, but we knew years ago that if you sing to cows, they'll give more milk. Really? And they're happy. So you were you singing to the cows? Oh, yes, were... I'd be singing all the popular songs. You can get the rhythm of the song when you're milking. So some <laughs> songs are better than others than milking. Oh, them. yes. I mean, you wouldn't have a slow one. <laughs> <laughs> We always sang at home because uh, there was no radio when no. I was a child and my eldest sister was the pianist and my grandfather used to bring musical books from the shows when we'd be around the uh, piano singing, singing hymns and singing songs. Was there anything you hated doing on the farm? Hay time. The seeds got everywhere and I mean literally everywhere and of course it was always in the hot weather that we were doing the hay it would get on your hair, it <laughs> yeah. stick to you, and they were itchy. The seeds were itchy. Yeah. I don't like the hot weather at all, so <laughs> I suffered in those days. <laughs> Manx Radio, my kind of sound. We're going to return to that conversation with wartime land girl Laura Briggs a little later in this programme to find out how she spent her time off and learn about a riot and the difficulties of recruitment. We've just heard Laura admit that there were some jobs on the farm that she really disliked. But now we're going to meet someone who didn't like anything about farm life because he longed to follow a family tradition and become a joiner. We're in Balaf now and winding the clock back 24 years to meet husband and wife Kenny and Connie Brew, starting with Kenny telling David Collister about his childhood. Born in the village in 1920 and then we moved from there up the glen to the old mill house and then I went down to the Balaf Curricks to live with my grandparents and I was brought up with them. In the Curricks? In Braff Curricks, yes. And we oh. walked up there to Braff School every day. And all this road here between the churches here from the village was only a dirt road, just a horse track. That's all it was. Yeah. And the playground was only soil. And we had three classrooms. And the middle room had a big black stove in it and two big black kettles on it. And the teacher in the middle class used to put them on if we'd up as 11, quarter to 12, and boil water for us, make a cup of tea or whatever we were having. Mm. And we'd be bringing our own sandwiches. I left Blaffert when I was 14, yeah. I couldn't get a job and I left school and I went to work for Ballamona down on the farm. Doing what? Mostly after the horses. Well, general work, you see, really. Did you like the farm work? No, not really. No, I always wanted to get away from it. And I always hankered to be a joiner because it was all in the family. Going back to my father and my grandfather, no, they're all carpenters and wheelwrights. And I seemed to want to, be, to do the same. But my father was a ship's carpenter. He was at sea all his life. We're going to talk here to Mrs Brew. When were you born, Connie? 1915. 1915. But you weren't born in here. No, I was born in the little mill, Onken. Where did you go to school then? I went to Onken School. What do you remember of your school days then? Oh, well, we had a good playground out in the field. We used to play hockey at dinner time. Girls played hockey. And then there was a big uh, field and the boys had that gardening. It was a good school, was Onken School. And we had a cross schoolmaster, Mr Wilkinson. Cross, was he? Oh, he was cross. The boys come in one day and the doll got into trouble because they'd been smoking. He put them all across the desk. Give them a good uh, few a whacks. Good tannin on the backsides. <laughs> <laughs> well, what used to happen, you see, in the summertime, the people that was working over at Duncan Head, mm. they were bringing their children over, you see. Oh. They had to go to school while they were over. Well, then they were little rascals. But well, you see, they were bringing cigarettes and things over oh. and giving them to our boys. All right. yeah. So, of course, our boys got lathered. But the girls were all well behaved, I suppose, were they? Yes, not bad. We'd be mischievous sometimes, but yeah. we weren't bad. No. So you did you lose your mother when you were young then? I was 12 and a half when she died. So then I came down to Balaf to live with us, Mrs Kane. They'd been friends of my mother and father when they were young. And her daughters had died and she wanted a girl. So that's how I came oh. down to Balaf. I came and lived with them and I came in as one of their own. What did you think of Balaf compared to Onken. Well, I enjoyed it. You see, the girls didn't get out and about like they do now. Oh, gosh, no. 
when you were done your work at night and the tea dishes were washed, come on, there's a bag of socks there wanting mending, or the socks were wanting new feet putting in them. Oh, we didn't get out at night time. Oh, we had to work at night time. But they taught you how to cook a good meal then, didn't they? Yes, but no fancy stuff. Mm. A good pot of broth. We used to get young rabbits, put them in salt and water all night, and roast them, and they were like chicken. They were good. They killed a pig, and then there was spare rib pies going, and you put a crust on top of them. Well, when did you uh, come across Kenny then? He was going to church, and I was going to church. That's when we met him. We used to church together, and we'd be all walking home together at night. What was around here in the way, more shops and things in those days? In the village there yeah. was. Uh, but then, you see, I didn't live in the village. I lived down in what we call the Krongtu, yeah. down by the old church. Well, we were a different lot. We didn't mix up much with the village once, right. did we? There was eight shops in this village, eight shops. There was a, the big main store on the corner was the post office and shop, general grocery stores. And you see, then they had to come up with pony and traps or that or, and they could buy it by the sack of flour and sh- sack of sugar and all that sort of stuff at them days you yes. see because there was nowhere else to go and then where the toilets is now in Belaf used to be a butcher shop and the slaughterhouse down behind the one stop shop that shop wasn't there and then up the glen on the left was a bakehouse a fellow with a big horse and cart but the you know the old square baker uh, yes. he was coming around all around Curricks and all around here selling bread oh, oh my old Bobby Christian wasn't he he was calling the horse Rocket and then you go down the village and you come to what used to be the police station. Now, Dibs had a store there, grocery store, Dibs had yeah. a store there. And then across the other side of the road was the cobbler, the Jamaica, old, old, old cell. And he used to cut a hair and all that. So he used to go and get your hair cut from and all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe handy was. And then there's a tailor shop further down. And then further down again, there was another grocery shop. They're just houses now. Yeah. The only shop that's in the village now, if any, consists of what they call the one stop shop. And I built that 30 years ago. Did you? Yeah. Was the village policeman about, was it? Yes, at Michael there was one. I got fined one year, but the coroner come and he said, I've got a fine for you. And I said, what for? He said, you didn't take a licence out for your dog. Well, I said, it wasn't my fault and I don't admit it because (laughs) I said, I didn't do it on purpose. My dog goes everywhere with me. And we had the children then. And I said, even yesterday, I said she was in Ramsey with me. So he'd gone through the books. John Brideson was in the village. He'd gone through the books on the Sunday and he'd found that I hadn't taken a licence out. So I got fined. Nearly made a criminal of you, didn't he? Nearly made me a criminal. (laughs) Why is that famous emporium of inspired domestic embellishments and unusual gifts of class and distinction called the Port Erin Gaslight and Aerated Waters Company? when it doesn't sell gaslight and it doesn't sell aerated waters and its premises are situated in Castletown and Ramsey. Answers on a tasteful Victorian postcard, please. Well, it's not just the stories that are vintage in the archive room. On the shelf marked A for advertising, we've got lots more like that. And now let's go back to Laura Briggs talking with David Collister about her time as a member of the Manx Women's Land Army during the war years. We rejoin the conversation as David asks Laura about her time off. Do you get some weekends off then? Oh, yes. It was supposed to be every other weekend. Used to travel on the bus on the what they called the Ballamore Strait, on which Ballamona was situated. And bus conductors and drivers, they were wonderful because they knew. I don't know how they did it. Most of them were countrymen, and they would know when my time was up for catching the bus home or going into Ramsey yeah. on a Saturday, and they would wait for me. Really? Yes, they would wait at the gate. Yeah. They would go over to the cronk and turn and come back, and often enough I was late. I don't know what the other people on the bus thought, but <laughs> they were very kind down there. I mean, they just sort of gathered you in, and, yeah. and they would help whenever they could. Did you get any dances? you got the pictures, anything like that? Oh, when we came to Belaf, um joined the Girls' Friendly Society, Miss Burgess, Miss Frieda Burgess, used to, to help run the Girls' Friendly Society at the church, and Mrs Elliot, the rector's wife. All through the wartime, I think, most of the district put on dances if they could or ran some form of concerts and things mm. to get money to send parcels to the prisoners of war or to the Red Cross at Belaf. We put on plays. When I was at Nokelo, 
used to go to Pila to the pictures because that was just about all that we could do. It was only a little cinema. One night, it must have been in September or October of 41, a notice came on the screen, would all military men report back to camp immediately? We didn't know what was on, but when I got out of the cinema, I realised that there was something radically wrong, found out afterwards that the internees had rioted, and the noise was dreadful. You wouldn't have thought it was a human noise at all. It was a terrible noise. I can't really describe it because yeah. there was such a volume of it and in those days, of course, there was no traffic, so of course you would hear it much more. Mm. And I was glad to get out of Peel and back to my digs at Patrick that night. Nobody would hear about this. I mean, it wouldn't be reported, would it? No, but I was talking once about this and Mrs Betty Hansen said, now, I remember very well the night that Laura's talking about. I was out with my father and mother and we came back and it was a horrifying noise. And she said, there were ordinary soldiers guarding these men at that time. And the government decided, I suppose it was the powers that be across, decided that they would get the Metropolitan Police over from London. And there were a terrific number sent to Peel to guard these men. There were also Mosley's men there. And I think that's what must have happened. They had started this riot. Anyway, they got the Metropolitan Police over to guard them. Well, while you were doing all this, Mr Howie was desperately trying to get people into the Women's Land Army, and the numbers were ne- never achieved anything like what they wanted, did they? Oh, no, the girls just didn't want to. If they were over 18, of course, it was easier to join one of the services, yeah. like the Navy, yeah. the Naval School over here, or the Air Force, whatever. Later on, it, they were compelled to join them, some, yes, some girls, they did. They? they did have the power to direct them, they called it, to direct them into the Land Army, and and um, there were, of course, some girls who refused to go and there were court cases over it and they would have been fined pretty heavily for those days. Yeah. One girl w- would have been fined five pounds a day, which was a colossal sum in those days, yes. if she didn't report to Nokelo. Luckily in the papers it did say that they turned up at Nokelo. Didn't they hold a big parade to try to drum up interest in the land land girls. Yes, but it wasn't a success. Unfortunately, they timed it on a Saturday afternoon, thinking that people would be in town, but the trouble being that it was a wet afternoon. Mm -hmm. And the band which was supposed to precede us from the bus station, the old bus station, over to the Villa Marina, refused to come out in case it ruined their instruments. So therefore, we had to march on our own. In (laughs) silence. Yes. And then most of the shoppers were going home at that time. And of course, anybody working in town would want to get home, so they weren't going to go and watch. I know my mother came to see me getting my long service armband. And uh, instead of having the presentation in the gardens of the Villa Marina, we had to have it in the main hall. And uh, we got our pat on the back from the governor. Lord Granville, was it? Lord Granville. And Lady Rose was there as well. Yeah. He did give the hint then that the powers that be would have a heavier hand with some of the girls who were not responding and they would be drafted into the land army. It was said that day. But having said it about the girls who refused to work, some of the other land girls said, we took our hats off to those girls. They didn't want to do the work. They were honest about it. But... They did their best and they worked hard. Yes, you researched this many, many years after, of course, and and statistics and and figures have been difficult to come by, have they? Yes, the records seem to have been destroyed. I mean, there were quite a lot of girls out on the farms that hadn't been through Nokelo, so their names weren't on the payroll. But they had the uniform just the same as we did. Looking back at it now, was it really a tough time for most girls? It was start off working in the fields for long hours, heavy work in the summer time, you got the best of the weather, in mm. the winter time you got the worst of it. And I don't think I'd have done anything else really. I wouldn't have done. If you had to do it again, would you look forward to it or not? Well, I've been doing it for the last 50 years. <laughs> it was training for you, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Very true words from Laura Briggs talking 24 years ago with David Collister. And that's all we've time for this week. But I'll have more people for you to meet and places to visit if you join me at the same time next week in the archive room. But for now, let's turn off the lights and close the door. I'm Judith Lay saying thank you for listening and wishing you a very good evening. Mm -hmm.